Well, we're studying through John's gospel, and we are in chapter 16, and I omitted the last verse of the chapter last week. So that's where we are, chapter 16, verse 33. So while you're turning there, you know, Miss Gail and I went out to dinner the other night, and our server, uh, right from the beginning of the evening, seemed to be uh, just really uptight, kind of distressed, you know? And didn't know why, and, you know, she was really having a very difficult time. Um, and you don't know why. I mean, everybody deals with something different, right? But at the end of the evening, when she gave me the bill, she had placed upon the bill, go in peace. And I thought, well, that was interesting. Hmm? Yeah. So Miss Gail, when she came over again, said, why did you write this on here? And she said, well, I'm an Episcopalian, and that's what we say to people, and... And uh, she said, but you know, everybody, you know, everybody, and, and everybody's dealing with something almost with tears, you know. And so, you know, Miss Gail, she pops up and she gives her a big hug. And all of a sudden there's a moment here that takes place. And, you know. But it's true. One of the greatest needs in our lives individually is his peace. One of the greatest needs in our marriages is his peace, our communities, our nation, our world. Look at all of the distress, all of the tension, all the division, all the hatred. If you were in Europe, and surely if you were in Ukraine, you'd be praying this morning for peace, right? When the Hebrews, when they would greet one another, or even depart from one another, what would they say? Shalom, that's the word, that's the Hebrew word for peace, shalom. And in the Greek text, they would say, arene, arene is the Greek word for peace. What does it mean, a cessation of hostilities? Is that what they're talking about? What is the peace that God is talking about when he offers you his shalom? The Jews would say, shalom aleichem. Why would they say it that way? And you would return by, shalom aleichem? With all my heart, with all my lips, with all my mind. I wish you peace. That's why they're saying that. Shalom alaikum. You know, the Muslims say, salam alaikum. But it means the same thing. And it means you want that person to experience peace in the totality of their being. And particularly, not just outwardly, right? But where do we need to have that peace more than any place else? Inwardly. Everything can be right circumstantially, but if you're not right inwardly, and if you're not right with the Lord, you have no Peace, right? Hmm. You, you know that little thing that people write, N-O, Jesus, N-O, peace, right? No Jesus, no peace. But K-N-O-W, Jesus, K-N-O-W, peace. To know Jesus is to know peace. Hmm? Hmm. That's why he came into the world, to reconcile us to God the Father, to bring peace between us and he. And then we have peace within ourselves. And then we have peace one with another. And oh, one day, one day, one day, this whole world will be in peace, right? Mm. Yeah, the angels declared, glory in the highest. Peace on earth. Shalom on earth. Well, when will that peace on earth happen? When Shar Shalom, that's his name, Shar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. When Shar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Jesus returns, he's going to bring peace to the earth. Until that day, he said, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. Now, we're at the end of the Seder meal that Jesus was celebrating with his Passover, with his uh, disciples, this last Passover, Pesach. And he's told them some very disturbing things from chapter 13 to chapter at the end of chapter 16, what were some of the disturbing things that he told them which would trouble their hearts, which would steal their peace if they're only looking at it from one perspective? Okay, everything you said. <laughs> he said, I'm going away. Oh, my, my, my. There's nothing more painful than someone you love goes away. Hmm? That's a terrible thought. That he'd be going away. Where are you going, Jesus? And we can't go with you. What else did he tell them? He said, this night you all will forsake me. You'll forsake me. 
Oh, and by the way, one of you will betray me. One of you is a traitor among us. Now, we know who that was, right? And why did he betray him? 30 pieces of silver. How crazy could that be? You know. He also told him, he said, now this rock that you guys think is such a powerful man, who is that? Peter? He will deny me tonight three times before the cock crows twice. Wow. Oh, very, very disturbing news. And you have to know that their minds had started to swirl in many, many, many different directions, and their their heart was in their throat at this point. You ever been that way? You ever get that bad news? Hmm. April 30th, 2003. My first wife, Roberta, called me. Meet me at the church. She was just going for an appointment. Meet me at the church. We were here, kneeling. Wow, we're going out of town. We got to get ready. No, just, just pray with me. Oh, my heart was in my throat. That's when she informed me, that the doctor informed her that she had cancer. A cancer that would take her out of this world. The doctor, I went home and I started to do some research. Then I knew she was going to be leaving me. Oh, I know exactly what these boys were feeling. Your heart is in your throat. Your mind is swirling. And you need desperately a peace that surpasses your circumstance. A peace that goes beyond understanding. It can't be explained, but it certainly can be experienced. I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So Jesus would end this discourse that evening at that Seder, at that Pesach, and he'd say, I've spoken these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have, oh, but cheer up. Cheer up. Be of good good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. Has he? Yes, he really has. Now, he hasn't taken possession of that which is rightfully his yet. He is the king of this world. And he's coming to take possession of that which is rightfully his. This earth, does he want the planet? No, he's after the treasure there and that pearl of great price. You, the church, that's what he has come to receive. But he said, until that day, you're going to have troubles in this life. Do we have troubles in this life? Oh, gosh, we do. And doesn't it seem like in so many ways things have gotten worse and worse? I mean, the, the, the madness of some of the decisions and the direction that our culture is going in. makes no sense at all except from a spiritual perspective that we're approaching, as Peter would say, the end of all things is at near. Be serious, be sober-minded in your prayers, be fervent in your love one for another. Hmm. So if if never before, I mean, we need his peace more now than ever, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Because we have no idea what lies ahead, but we know that he can take us through whatever may come about. And so he says here in chapter 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. It's got to be in Jesus, right? And O Jesus, and O peace. No, to Yadah the Lord. What is it? And when, when the Bible always refers to you knowing the Lord, what does that mean? In intimacy, intimacy of relationship. You see, the most uh, sacred of all relationships is a marriage relationship. Oh, God, if we need peace anywhere, it's in marriage relationships today, don't we? (sighs) So many open marriages, so many people living outside of marriage. And then the uh, rate of divorce is epidemic. 
the average marriage that ends up in divorce only, only survives eight years. Isn't that pitiful? When it's to be the relationship that's supposed to be most life-giving, as we allow and yield to the Holy Spirit to love one another. My love isn't sufficient. It's not going to carry our relationship and our marriage. And her love is not sufficient. It's not going to carry our relationship. Why? It's a selfish love. I love her for what she can do for me, right? Yeah, when I saw Gail, I said, Shalom, Miss Gail. <laughs> <laughs> she said, get away from me. No. No. But it's a shame. And why? Why are so many marriages? Why? Well, you know, that slap that everybody's talking about. You know, that. You didn't hear about that? Will Smith slapped to this comedian, Chris Rock. <clears throat> well, that slap came as a, at a point of his frustration in life, too. I mean, you know, talking about broken people and no peace in a home. I mean, these people have everything they want, right? I mean, how could life be any better from a materialistic standpoint, from a place of fame and fortune? Yet here his wife has to have a relationship with a friend of her son's. And then she tells her husband, that neutered man, hey, I just needed some pleasure. I haven't had any pleasure in a long time. I just needed some fun. So now they have an open relationship. You obviously convinced him that, you know, you need to let me have some fun. I'll let you have your fun. Is that what marriage is about? Having fun? If you're only married because you want the happiness and the fun that it's going to bring, it will end up in divorce. Marriage will sanctify you more than any other relationship in life. You'll discover that one day, Austin, angel. <laughs> it is a sanctifier. Yes, but why? Why are so many marriages ending in divorce? Because there's no peace inside in, in them as individuals. Why, are there so, why is there so much division in our, in our nation today? Because there's so much unrest, anxiousness, frustration. Why would Russia feel it necessary to brutalize this nation of Ukraine? Jesus told us there'd be no peace outside of him. And the more our world, the more our nation, the more our families in this community, the more you as individuals walk away from the peace that Jesus offers, the only result will be hatred and division, brokenness and suffering and sorrow. But Jesus is saying here, you can, you can have peace, peace in me. Now this should be, uh, bring to your remembrance uh, what I have taught before with regard to this peace that God is offering us. God offers us this peace in three ways, right? Peace with God. So where do we find that peace with God? Romans chapter 5, turn with me there. I wish, uh, I wish I could operate every single day and every moment of that day in his peace, but I, I, I don't. Most of you probably do a better job of that than I do. But there are times when I get very anxious or very irritated, and really, most often, it's just I'm upset with myself because I'm really trying to be all that he wants me to be, but, well, I don't know of anybody who's reached sinless perfection. Maybe Victor. <laughs> but... But I don't know anybody, and no one ever will, will they? Will they? But we're striving. As, as Paul would say, I press on, right? I'm striving. I'm agonizing. I'm doing all that I can to become everything that Christ wants me to be. But, you know, I, I disappoint myself so often. I never disappoint God, really, do we? If we're yielded to him, if we're surrendered to him, and, and he knows that, that we love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, he knows we're going to make mistakes. He knows we're going to fall short. Right, Henry? But mom loves you anyway, doesn't she? Yeah. 
even though she knows you're going to fall short. But you're becoming a good man, aren't you? Yeah, I can see that. Well, the same with our relationship with the Lord. You understand that? Now, now, when we fall short, who do we get frustrated with more than anybody else? Ourselves. But where do we show it? In our relationship with others, right? We need, listen, listen to me. You need to be patient with yourself. And therefore, long-suffering with others, right? But if you're impatient with yourself, you're going to be very short-fused with others, aren't you? You're going to have too many expectations that you lay upon others. Should never be. And let's, let's all purpose this week of Holy Week that's coming, right? This, we're approaching Holy Week. Holy Week begins next Sunday. And we have been practicing the season of Lent. Lent is not just a Lent is not just a Catholic thing, although I heard somebody teaching the other day who I admire and respect, and that they were poo-pooing the practice of Lent. Thinking it only goes back to Catholicism. No, no, no. It goes back much farther than that to a Jewish practice of what? Teshuva, teshuva, teshuva. The Jews, ancient Jews, would practice teshuva 40 days before the most holy day in all of Israel, which was Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is the most holy day in all of Israel in the Jewish calendar. And 40 days prior to that, they would begin to turn their hearts to God. And that's what the word teshuva means. It was return, return, return unto me. Don't we always have to check ourselves and say, I need to return to the Lord. I need to act like the Lord wants me to be. I need to yield to the Lord so I can become all that he wants me to be. Right? We're constantly, the whole book of Jeremiah is return to me, return to me, return to me. God crying out to his people. But they didn't listen. They wouldn't do it. And so those 40 days are returning in our hearts, in our lives, in our desires, in our dreams, our expectations to the Lord and all that he has for us. And 10 days prior, 10 days, the last 10 days of that period of teshuva leading up to Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, where they would ask that God would forgive them of their sins, that were called the days of Oh, the days of awe, where they're far more serious minded with regard to how far they have fallen short and not yielding to the Lord and becoming what he wants us to be. Well, let's purpose to do that. We'll use this week to prepare for a holy week. Hmm? Once again, and I've been encouraging you to do this. Well, here... We have peace with God. Now, if you're saved here, sitting here this morning, and you recognize that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins, because you are a sinner, right? Hmm. Lori, are you a sinner? Lori, have you ever lied? What does that make you? A liar. Liar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Zach, have you ever stolen anything? Yes. What does that make you? Makes you a thief. We got a liar here. We got a thief here. <laughs> Nathan, have you ever blasphemed? Yes. What's that make you? Blasphemer. Blasphemer. Oh, David. Yes. <laughs> I didn't even ask the question yet. We know. We we did. We did. So we have a room full of liars and thieves and blasphemers and fornicators and adulterers because if you lusted in your heart, Jesus said, you know, it's a, I mean. So first of all, you need to understand that the Holy Spirit has come to convict you of? Sin. You're a sinner. Listen, you don't need a physician until you know you're sick. I had no idea, no idea what went on in uh, cancer research. Until that day, April 30th, 2003. And then, and then it was surreal going into the Cancer Center of the Carolinas and then, and then learning everything I needed to know about what is taking place here. And I wanted the best physician that I could find. That's what you need to do when you're talking to people. And if you're one of those people here this morning and don't recognize you're a sinner, that your heart is, is wretched, you live with a traitor, and the traitor's inside you. You're sick. I got my stone. It's up in New York waiting for me. I just got a chisel in the date. Told you I was sick. 
<laughs> and when you know you're sick, you'll seek out the physician. When you know you're a sinner, you'll seek out a savior. We sang to be rescued. What's that Greek word? Soteria, to be rescued. Soteria. Soteriology is where the study of salvation. So, so once you realize you need the Savior, you come to the Savior, and what does he do? He cleanses you. He washes you clean, right? For such were some of you, liars, blasphemers, thieves, right? But you've been washed, but you've been justified, but you've been sanctified. Praise the Lord, right? So you declare, you convict of sin, of righteousness, and then judgment. If you don't turn to the Lord, there's a judgment awaiting people who refuse the witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Jesus. Yeah. Well, Paul is describing for us what, what takes place, what happens, what has happened to all of us during this time. Look at Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, speaking to the believers, and you can only be justified, and justified means God looks upon you just as if you've never, ever sinned. What, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. God looks down upon you, Lori, now, and he doesn't see a liar. <laughs> no, he sees his daughter. Why? Because he looks down in you and he sees Jesus. That's justification. Justifi Jesus took upon himself my sin, my nature, my everything, and gave me his righteousness, his nature. Therefore, I've been justified by faith, and we have peace with God. That's that shalom, arena here in the Greek text. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into that grace in which we stand. Pastor David is talking about that grace last time he was with us, sharing. Yes, we stand in grace. Why? Because you have been saved by grace, the charismata, the grace gift that the Holy Spirit gives, that God gives to the believer. By grace you have been saved through faith. That's the grace gift, that faith that God has given you to believe. Open up your heart, open up your mind, open up your ears, open up your life, open up your eyes to who Jesus really is. Yes? This grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also glory in, ooh, in this world you'll have. Now, there's, listen to me. As hard as it is to believe at times, there's not a trouble, there's not a tribulation, there's not an affliction, there's not a sorrow, there's not a pain, there's not a trial that isn't going to come into our life that he's allowed it. It hasn't gone by him first. He's sovereign. Do you believe in the sovereignty of God? God is in total and complete control. So every, everything that comes our way is either by his permissive will or his active will. But nonetheless, everything, everything that he allows to come into our life happens as a result of his sovereignty. He chooses to allow that to come in. Why? Because he wants to hurt us? Never, nay. Those sorrows, those troubles, those afflictions, they will mature us. They will perfect us. They make us more Christ-like. First thing that takes place when those sorrows hit you, you're humbled aren't you? Yeah. But not only that, we also glory in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. What's that word, perseverance? Hupamone. We dance to hupamone, right? <laughs> hupamone simply means to stay under a trial, under an affliction, under a, under a situation, and, and don't cut and run until God has done all that he wanted to do in that situation. So often we, we want to be rescued from our trials and our tribulations, from our sufferings and our sorrows. But if we get rescued prematurely, we're not going to learn the lessons we need to learn through those, the very difficult times in life. <coughs> Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance? Character. character. What kind of character are we talking about? Christ-likeness. That's right, Christ-likeness. And character? And what, what's Hope. Huh? The hope that's in your chest. The hope that's in my chest. Hope chest. David calls it a treasure chest. We got treasure in our chest. We'll talk about it maybe, maybe, maybe. Hope chest. This hope is an absolute certainty. It's not a maybe. I wish. I hope. No. When the Bible talks about hope, it's an absolute certainty that we have that He will accomplish all that He has set out to do. When we are justified, we are sanctified. And the sanctification process that's working itself out in our life is what he's talking about. This character that's being developed through that perseverance of staying in the trial. What's the biggest trial you face? 
being you. <laughs> Some of you don't understand that, do you? You will. You need to before you leave here. But one of the biggest trials we face is just me being me, right? But I'm to persevere in that trial. Why? Because I know that God is working within me, being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you, justifying you, sanctifying you. Sanctification affirms and validates that good work that's going on. And he who began that good work in you will complete it until the day that Christ comes. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Now, now that's, that promise is only to those who know that good work is going on. Do you understand? That sanctification process where you know, yeah, I, 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 you know, three steps forward, two steps back. Three steps forward, one step back. But, it, but, it, but you're progressing. You cannot lose if you don't. Right. Just like my weight loss program, you know. I've been on it for 70 years. <laughs> yes, perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. No, 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 because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit affirms that we are His and that one day He will come for us and we'll be glorified. Your justification is validated by your sanctification. Your sanctification gives you every confidence of knowing the ultimate glorification is going to occur. You understand that? If you're living a lost life, there should be no hope of being glorified. You understand? And I'm not saying you don't make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But I was saying, if, you, if there's nothing about your life that anyone would see or experience to make them indicate, to indicate for them in any way that you love Jesus, that you're a, a believer, then there is no reason for you to think you have the hope of heaven. I want you to understand that. But unfortunately, in our day, there's no fear of God in thinking that there will be a judgment that comes. The Holy Spirit came to convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And no one spoke more of judgment than Jesus. Isn't that amazing? But no one offered the love of God more than Jesus. For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's who we were, weren't we? Poor baby, got no strength. No spiritual strength. No inclination towards the Lord. Oh, but it gets worse, doesn't it? For scarcely for a righteous man would anyone die, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die, but God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were yet still, Christ died for us. Now, you see, a lot of people think they're just weak, you know. Well, you know, I, I, I do more good than bad, and so when judgment day comes, I think, I think I'm going to be okay because I'm a, I'm a good poison. You know, are there any good poisons? No. No, you're far more than just a little strength. Right? You make mistakes. No, no, no. What does it say here? You're a sinner. Sinner. Now, we, we talk about that all the time, right? We know the difference between sinners or transgressions or iniquities. We have sins, we have transgressions, and we have iniquities. What are sins? We miss the mark. Right? Oh, you have a little strength. You know, you miss the mark. Transgressions, what are they? You deliberately cross the line. God said, don't do this, and you did it anyway. All of us are guilty of that. All of us have committed transgressions where we knew the will of God and chose not to do it. In the Old Testament, there was no sacrifice for that. Do you know that? Thank God we're in the age of grace. That God covers my transgressions. And my sins and my transgressions are in all, a, all a result of my iniquities. What is that? My wicked, sinful heart. I need a heart transplant, right? That's what he's going to go on to talk about. Listen. Verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath to come. What is that, judgment? For if when we were enemies, enemies, it gets worse. Little strength, sinner, enemy, fighting against God. Hmm. 
while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved, sudzo, right? Saved, soteria is the word uh, that that's, comes from the word sudzo. What is that? International Distress Call, SOS, Sudzo, ISOIS. Reconciled, saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation, peace with God. We've been reconciled. You were enemies of God. Well, you're not an enemy of God. I was an enemy of God. Our whole society now. That's how much it's changed here. That's how much we need his peace and, and, and that settledness of mind and heart, that quietness that only he can give in this crazy world in which we live, right? Some of you have those bracelets. God's sovereignty is my sanity, sanity in these crazy, crazy times. Because every major institution that we held dear that was representing what we believed as in the Judeo-Christian philosophy of life, Old Testament, New Testament, and now is hostile Hostile to everything we believe, everything we hold dear, even the mouse down in Florida. <laughs> it's terrible. But we have been reconciled to God. We have peace with God. That's the first stage of this shalom, this peace that God wants to bring in total in our life, in whole. Now we need to have the peace of God. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippianos chapter 4. That's a beautiful sound, isn't it? All these people turning the pages in their Bibles. I've been to so many churches where nobody even has a Bible. And even what they put on the screen is inaccurate. They like to change things around a little bit. For their eisegesis. What's eisegesis? You put into the text what you want it to say. Eisegesis versus exegesis. Exegesis. You take out, you let the text speak for itself. Hmm? You don't try to manipulate the text. The New World Translations of the Bible, who, who wrote those? Who, what, what group carries the New World Translation? Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness. They're I said Jesus. They put into the text what they wanted to say. They don't allow the text to speak for itself. And, and where did they distort, what did they distort more than anything else? The person of Jesus Christ. That at best he's, a, he's an archangel. He's not God himself. Nothing could be farther from the truth, right? All right. So in uh, Philippians here, let's pick it up, uh, verse 17 of chapter 3. Then we'll move into chapter 4. Brethren, joining in following my example, right? Paul is talking to the Philippian church there. And he said to follow my example as I follow Christ. And note those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Uh, my wife and I were having a discussion this morning over my coffee and toast. My dog, he's getting old. He's going to be an old dog. Yeah, he's getting old. He'll be... But boy, does he sure love toast in the morning, you know? <laughs> and so he, w he was down in his place. He wouldn't come upstairs until I said, Schniggers, toast time. <laughs> Here he comes. And, uh, and then we, we got, I don't know how, but we got on the subject of how some people treat their dogs like their children. Your dog is not a child. Stop it. Stop it. It's insanity. Now, listen, I'm a dog lover. I've had dogs my whole life. I love dogs. I, I will never not be a dog owner, Okay. But I love children far more. Yeah. I do. And, and a dog is not a child. Stop it. Because we treat our animals better than we do our children today. It's disgusting. Right? And I said, and the one way you know is because their God is their belly. Right? 
<laughs> dog's God is his belly. I can, you know, give me your dog and I'll get your dog, to, I'll train your dog to do anything, right? Through treats and through praise. The dog is their, their, their God is their belly, though. You, you start it all by what they desire, what their pleasures are. And if it's not their belly, then you get to develop a ball drive and you get them to do anything you want. Why? Because they live on an animal plane. All their physical appetites are how you control them, right? Because that's what they live to. They're, all their thinking is on their belly. That dog will sit there and just look at me, waiting, waiting, waiting. You know, I could put a piece of toast in the toaster and press it down, and he hears it from the other end of the house, downstairs, and boom, away he comes. <laughs> it's toast time, right, right, right? You know, the God is their belly. Now, before you were saved, that was precisely the way you acted. That's what Paul is describing here. You're on an animal plane. All of your body appetites controlled all your thinking until you're saved. Then everything changes. That's what he's referring to here. Now, you know these people we were talking about. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. The end is destruction. Their God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. There is no shame today, is there? None. I mean, what, what, what is it with these, with these young girls now just sending pics of themselves naked all over the place to all their... What is that about? How can there be no shame? This is spring break. Have you been reading about some of the craziness that goes on in spring break? Florida, California. Listen, our young people are animals. I, I don't take any pleasure in saying I'm not. I'm not trying to say that in, in an evil or crude way. That they've been raised to be on an animal plane. Their soul is dead to God. But that's what it means to be saved, to be awakened, to be born again, born anew from above. For our citizenship, no, 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 no. Our citizenship is in heaven, not in hell, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why are we waiting for Him? To rescue us, right? Hebrews tells us he'll come a second time, but not for salvation. Not for spiritual salvation. He comes to rescue his church the second time. Hmm? Who will transform your lowly body that it may become his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, there was a little bit of a problem there at the church in Philippi. And what was the problem here? Chapter 4. Who? Euodi and Syntyche? Who are they? Well, a couple of ladies. A couple of a ladies stirring up some trouble there at the church. I implore Euodi and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say, rejo re again, rejoice. Listen, stop the argument. And we know from another text that there was a problem there. There was a division being caused there. And he said, listen, I want you to rejoice in the Lord. See your, the unity that we have, the Christ-likeness. We're a diverse group of people here. Different ethnic backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, come from different regions of the country, some from another country completely. All of the diversity is here. And men who believe they're men and women who believe they're women, you know? <laughs> that's, a, that's a queer thing today, isn't it? <laughs> But, we'll, but the unity that we have in this diversity is because of Christ. Where we get the term university, right? A, a variety, diverse disciplines, fields of study in one campus, but all together it's united, right? In that one campus, unity and diversity. And that's what we have in Christ. Only in Christ can we have that unity. Only in Christ can you get together a tax collector and a what? A zealot, right? What did zealots do to tax collectors? Yeah. But in Christ, wow, the peace that was there. Jew and? Wow, wow. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Hallelujah. Let your gentleness, your meekness, your humbleness be known unto your graciousness, be known unto all men. Why? For the Lord's hand, the Lord's coming. Now, if you believe that then, it sure is true now, isn't it? The Lord is at hand. The Lord's coming. Hmm? 
Be anxious, fearful, fretful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the shalom, the irene of, of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Now, uh, we have peace with God by surrendering, yielding. Once we do that, and we really now want to learn how to walk with God, we have peace of God. God comes into our life and gives us his peace. And you can have that peace no matter what the situation would be. I watched. I watched as God so powerfully and supernaturally gave my Roberta that peace. And after we got off our knees here that day, she maintained that peace until the day she left, November 7, 2006. And I said, my dear, my dear, I can't believe you're leaving me for another man. That's what I said to her, really. And she said, well, he's a better man than you are. <laughs> I said, I know he is, but he doesn't need you. I do. You know. I, I need it. Now I know. These many years later, don't we? I know she needed to leave for me, for what God wanted to do in me. Hmm? And some of you have suffered a great loss, but you know now, you, hopefully you know now, that need has happened, must happen, for what he wanted to do in you. Peace with God, peace of God. And then what's the final stage? Peace in God. Peace in God. And that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about in John 16, when he said, I will give you the peace in God. Quite often, in Paul's writings in particular, he's called the God of peace, the God of peace, the God of peace. Now, this peace that we are going to experience of God is by... by directly related to where we put our mind. That's why he says in verse 8, anyway, first, in verse 7, I read that, right? The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. You can't understand it, but you can experience it. And it surpasses every circumstance. And it'll guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That word guard in the Greek text is a garrison. It's a military term where, where he sends his angels to guard over your mind and your heart. But in verse 8, he says, now this is our part. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is anything, any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things you, which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. What are those things describing? Jesus. That's all Jesus. The only thing that fits that description, those adjectives of what, what that, this, this love, this peace, this joy, this purity, this virtue, it's all Jesus. It's no human being. So where do you have to keep your mind? On Jesus. On Jesus. That's, now, when you lose your peace is when you've got your mind on the world or your mind on yourself. Your mind on your circumstance rather than the one who controls the circumstance. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 for a minute. We're talking about how to handle these trials and afflictions and still maintain the peace that God wants us to have. Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians in verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, Paul said, but Jesus Christ the Lord. This celebrity Christianity is crazy today, isn't it? They talk more about who their celebrity is rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. They have more faith in that celebrity than they do the Lord. And thankfully, the Lord lets many of these people come crashing down so that people can realize it's not in any individual. Don't follow me, but follow Christ as I follow him. Right? For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus only and ourselves, your bond servants for Jesus Christ. That word bond servant is doulos. You know what that means. Right? We're all, uh, to study for the ministry is to study for the slavery. You want to be in the ministry? You want to be a slave. Slave to whom? Slave to all of God's people. When we're slave to God, we're slave to his people, in service to his people. Verse 6, for it is the God, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. What is that speaking of? What event? Creation. Genesis 1 Three. 
It was nothing but darkness. And God said, let there be light. Now, he said that before he created what? The, the lights in the firmament. He didn't correct, create the lights of the firmament, the stars, the moon, the sun. He didn't create any of that until verse 14. Verse 3, though, he says, light be to dispel the darkness. Who might that be? Jesus. It was Jesus. Not that he was born, not that he was created, but he was manifest as the light. And the light he called Yom, day, and the, and the darkness he called night. Oh, isn't that interesting? Now, Jesus is the light. This is what he's talking about here. Just for a moment, think about this. In Genesis 1, it tells us that everything was complete darkness. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And then God said, light be. And Jesus was manifest. Poof. Isn't that what happened that day? When everything changed? When you were one way, but now you are who you are? And the difference was... Light be. Poof. Wow. You remember? All in darkness. And the light he called day, Yoma. And the, the, the darkness he called night. And what is that word for night? A twisting away from the light. Now, now listen, he wants you in his light. But, but all, all, that's, all that's necessary for you to be in the darkness. Once again, even as a believer, even as a saved individual, I can purpose to go back into darkness. I won't lose my salvation, but I can render myself and my witness so ineffective for God. But, but that word night, it's a twisting away from the light. Now, when you see that start to happen in somebody's life that you know, that you know they've been walking with God, you know they profess faith in Christ, you just get on your knees and you pray. I've seen it so often, beloved. It breaks my heart. And every time I begin to see it, I get so aggravated and so broken hearted, I gotta take it to God. You see someone who is so excited, so on fire, so shining in the light, and then suddenly there's this twisting away. Hmm. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of, in the face of Christ Jesus the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Wow. Hey, in that day, and particularly in Paul's world, there were Jews and there were Gentiles. And the Gentiles comprised two groups of people primarily. Who were they? They were the Greeks and the Romans, the Greeks and the Romans. So, so at, at that point in time, in Paul's world, there were really the three groups of people that made up his uh, associations and experiences. The Jews, the Greeks, the Romans. The Jews always sought after light. 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 You know any Greeks? What do Greeks prize? Knowledge. Knowledge. And Romans? Glory, the glory of Rome. Look at, look at the unity in the diversity of the cultures that Paul is addressing, and he hits them all. Jews who are pursuing light, Greeks who are pursuing knowledge, the Romans who are pursuing the glory, glory of Rome. Wow, in the face of Christ Jesus. Now, talking about how we endure these afflictions and these trials, but we have this treasure, this treasure of Jesus Christ, his light in us, in these earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. For we are hard-pressed. Oh, yeah. Hmm? The tribulations that he experienced, the tribulations that still exist in this life. When, when Jacob, the son, the, the father of Israel, right, the 12 tribes, he came before Pharaoh and he said, my days are, he was an old man at this point, he said, my days have been few and full of trouble. Job said, my life has been full of trials, troubles, and tribulations. As, as sparks run rise from the fire, so is trouble rising up in my life. Is that not true? We will have, he, exactly as Jesus said, you will have tribulation in this world. But be of good cheer. We're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Always caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Christ may be found or manifest in our bodies. For we do not live, excuse me, we who live are always delivered to death for, the, for Jesus' sake, that the life of Christ may also be manifested in our mortal lives. So then death is working in us, but life in you. What is he talking about there? 
What is he saying there? Death working in us, but life in you. We're always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. What is he talking about? What death? Death of self. Stop living your own life. We talked about that last week. He prophesied and he said, all you will forsake me. Of the 12, one was a traitor, right? We identified him. He was gone. He left the, the Seder, the Passover early. Who was that? Judas. Judas. And that left the 11. And now he's declaring here, he's saying, yeah, it's almost in hyperbole, but, you know, but the, all of you will forsake me. Well, that was true for the most part. There's one who wouldn't forsake him. There's one who wouldn't leave him. There's one whose love for the Lord commanded that he stay there even in, at the loss of his own life. Who was that? John. John. The apostle of love, we call him. Isn't that amazing? Now, this is the dying he's talking about. I have to continually offer myself as a living sacrifice unto God, wholly acceptable and well-pleasing, which is my reasonable act of worship. It says service, but it's my act of worship. Are you really presenting yourself to God or are you living your life? You come here on Sunday, you check a block. You come here on Wednesday, you check a block. You come here on men's study on Saturday, you check a block. But you're really not completely surrendered and yielded. It means we have to die to those things that would be a distraction. We have to die to those things that would, would interfere, become a, a stumbling block or a bump in the road to those things that God has for us to do. Ask yourself that question, what it might be. For since death is working in us, life in you. So as we die to ourselves, and he said we should pray always, pray last week when we, Jesus had mentioned at this point, you've asked nothing in my name. Now, ask the Father in my name, and he will grant you your every request. Now, what's the condition on that? You pray according to his will. You pray in the nature of his name. You ask anything in my name. Praying in his name means to pray in his nature, in his will. So, very specifically, we went through several texts last week. When you're praying in the nature of the will of Jesus Christ, what are you praying? Salvation, Salvation of others. That's God's will. Why did he come? For God so loved the world that he sent, right? The missionary heart of God, the Father, sending the Son, the Son's desires to see the whole world saved. There's enough lamb for everybody. <laughs> Is that your business? You're dying to self so that others can live? That's what we should be doing. Hmm. These, these two young men over here, you got to get to know them. God is, God is doing special work in their lives. He's got a calling upon their life. As, as I've known them these many months. I don't glorify them, but I glorify God and what God is doing in their heart and life. But they're not the typical. Thank you. For yielding to the Lord. So then death is working in us, life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, According to what is written, I believe, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore we speak. Do you? Do you tell everybody about Jesus everywhere you go? Hmm? Go in peace. Why did you write this? And then what did you put on the bottom? Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Now, if you believe, you need to speak. If you believe, you need to go out there and be a witness. You should be telling people that your primary responsibility now is to bear witness of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he's brought to the world, and especially now when we're approaching the final hour. Knowing that he who raised the Lord, up the Lord Jesus Christ will also raise up us with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace may spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Now, with regard to suffering, therefore, we do not lose heart. What did he say here previously? Huh? They're pressed down, they're perplexed, they're persecuted, they're struck down, they're dying for the Lord, they're delivered unto death. But what does he say? We don't lose heart. We don't give up. We got everything to live for. We don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Is that true? Yeah. Boy, you know, especially as you get older, right? You know? Ever since I uh, hit 70, I got this malady that was diagnosed, P.O.D. You know P.O.D., right? Pain of the day, you know? <laughs> 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 
Yeah, it started last night and didn't let go of me even to this morning, you know. <laughs> but here we go. The outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly eternal weight of glory. Is that true? Yeah. 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 Light versus weight. Affliction, right? Versus glory momentary versus eternal. What a contrast. Now, Paul could go through all that, and he, no one, I don't know of anyone, as I read church history, and I read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I don't know anybody that has suffered more for the cause of Christ than the Apostle Paul. And yet he says this momentary light affliction, not to be compared to that eternal weight of glory. Why? Because he did exactly what Philippians, what he wrote to the Philippians to do, put your mind on these things. When troubles hit, and when those afflictions and those sorrows, when those sufferings, when those testings come, put your mind where you need to on Christ. K-N-O-W, Jesus. And know that peace that only comes from him, the peace with God, peace of God, peace in God. Maybe we'll look at one more text. Go to Romans 8. You know, uh, Paul spends the first, Paul's, the book of Romans is Paul's treatise on the grace of God. And so the first seven chapters deal with the lostness of man. He, he, you know, he wants to make sure he understands that you're sick, that you understand you're sick and you need a physician, that you're, you're a sinner and you need a savior. And so he presents the case in those first seven chapters that all the world is lost. All the world is in need of Jesus Christ. Whether you're a Gentile who's living a heathen lifestyle or whether you're a Jew and just have religion. You need Jesus, right? Religion won't save you. People ask me if I'm a religious person. I say, no, I'm a spiritual person. I'm born again, born in the Spirit of God. Right? That's what will save you. Not your attendance at church. Right? McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Hanging around the garage don't make you a car. And going to church don't make you a Christian. But having Jesus in your heart, that makes all the difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's see, where do I want to pick it up? Therefore, verse 12, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, but to live according, not, acor not to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, you will put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the Spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the Spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Papa, Father, Abba, right? Abba was a very endearing term that they use. Even today, and as you go to Israel, you'll see the children refer to their parents, their father in particular, as Abba, Abba, Abba. Uh, here they refer to their father as Daddy, right? Daddy. You know who your daddy is. <laughs> My culture, it was Pa. You know, the Italian culture, we didn't call him Daddy or Abba. We said Pa. <laughs> Oh, my papa. You know? <laughs> now, what I want to point out here is the first seven verses he spends getting you lost, but what is the primary message in chapter 8? The Spirit. 22 times he mentions the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. We're saved by the Spirit. We live by the Spirit, and one day we'll be completely rescued home by the Spirit of God. For if we are then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 17, you see that? Mm -hmm. For the Spirit bears witness that we, that with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, in particular, how we handle suffering, that's what we're talking about. I have spoken these things to you that in me you will have peace. Shalom. But in the world, you will have, but be of good cheer. The, the peace that I will give you 
will overcome the tribulation and the suffering in this world. Verse 18 now, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not to be are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Wow. Isn't that something? Hmm? For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. What's he saying there? All of the world, all of creation. Next week is uh, Palm Sunday. And uh, I, I think the text I'm going to use is, again, uh, Re Luke chapter 19, where Jesus is going to make his way into Jerusalem. And the Pharisees are telling him to shut his disciples up because they're calling him the Messiah. And he says, if these be still, these very stones, stones will cry out. That'll be the first rock concert, right? Huh? These stones, these very stones will cry out. Nature is groaning, desiring to be put back into that state of paradise once again. We're in a fallen world. And that fallenness has not just affected man, it's affected our entire world. That's what he's talking about here. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly groans, eagerly waits for the redemption of the sons of God. Verse 20, chapter 8 of Romans, for the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. God allowed it to take place. It was his sovereign will. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Wow. The rocks will sing. And who's going to clap your hands? The trees. The trees will clap their hands, right? It says that, right? The rocks will sing. The trees will clap their hands. And what kind of trees are they? Palm trees. <laughs> you know, a lot of you aren't just, you're just not having fun this morning. This is a celebration of Jesus, isn't it? Yeah. Because the creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Not only that, verse 23 now, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For we were saved in this hope, that hope that is seen is not hope at all. For, who, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know how we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things, sufferings, tribulations, sorrows, afflictions, testings work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes for whom he foreknew he predestined and whom he conformed to me in the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren and moreover whom he predestined predetermined to save these he also called Galatos come the church is called the what's the Greek word for church Ecclesia, called out, called. Whom he called, these he also justified. That justification is that God looks upon you just as if you've never sinned. And whom he justified, these he also? Oh, Paul forgot something. There's an omission here, isn't there? What did he omit? Sanctification. Wow. He completely skipped this whole process that we go through, Right? We have to persevere with ourselves. He said, no, 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 no. If you're justified, you are. He said, you're not here. Where are you right now? You're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What a shalom that is, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. Hey, we're going to go out back and we're going to have a little bit of fellowship time and some food. Yeah. See how lucky my pot can get, you know, <laughs> have a pot luck. But before we do, I'd like to uh, pray the ironic blessing over you, okay? Why don't you turn to Numbers, chapter 6, as we stand.
Number six, the priestly blessing. In verse 22, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. And so say to them, What does God want to bless them with? Peace. Peace. The last thing he says, Shalom. Peace. I'll say it in Hebrew, and then we'll read it together in English, okay? Vaharekaka Adonai Vishmareka. Yeher Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka. Yesa Adonai Panavileka. Vesemaka Shalom. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace. Yeah. Father, we thank you for your peace, Lord. And as we end this service this morning, we ask you to bless the, all of the hands and all of the preparation that went into our little fellowship time this afternoon out back. Lord, would you just uh, season every conversation with your presence, Lord? Would you bless this food to strengthen our bodies to become truly your doulos, Lord? Your servants, Lord. I thank you for these who have come this morning in the sanctuary, those who are listening to me over the internet this morning, Lord. And we pray, we pray for that shalom, Lord, that peace. We are living in a crazy world, and there's so many things that trouble us, Lord. But we thank you that you have overcome our troubles and you've overcome this world, Lord. And we eagerly await your coming. In Jesus' holy name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you.